Welcome to the award-winning Dare to Dream podcast with Debbie Dashner, covering metaphysics, ETs, shamanism, and channeling. Here you will find spiritual inspiration from today's thought leaders, along with cutting-edge insights from our interstellar brothers and sisters and ancient shamanic wisdom. Now, here's a new episode of Dare to Dream with your host, Debbie Dashinger. Welcome to Dare to Dream. Debbie Dashinger here, and today I am speaking with world-renowned crop circle expert, Freddie Silva, who is an author and leading researcher of ancient civilizations, restricted history, sacred sites, and their interaction with consciousness. Dare to Dream won three Talk Radio Positive Change Awards, COV Award for Best Podcast Show, Welp Magazine, named Dare to Dream one of the top 20 best podcasts to listen to this year, and it is high ranking on Apple Podcasts. Membership is available now on YouTube. Go there for some private conversation sessions, meeting my guests. It's youtube.com slash Debbie Dashinger. I want to thank Dr. Dane here in Access Consciousness for sponsoring this show. Lo, these men are years. They do beautiful energy work out into the world. You can find out more about their classes at Dr. Dane, D A I N, here, H E E R dot com. I'm Debbie Dashinger. I am a galactic shaman. I do practice shamanism and I offer classes in that. I'm also a book writing expert and I help you to write your book. And I guarantee I take your book to international best-selling author. I also do some PR publicity work for some spiritual messengers, if you will, to get them out and allow them to have massive results. My gift to you is the free star seed report and video so you can find out which one of the 19 plus galactic star seeds you are find out more about your mission your purpose your strengths your weaknesses even what you look like and you can deep dive into this mind-blowing information it's at debbie-dashinger.com slash starseed d-e-b-b-i-d-a-c-h-i-n-g-e-r.com slash starseed I've got a new program opening, and it's going to be three weeks of working on you using animal spirit medicine. The program is a profound journey into the sacred mystical realm of animal beings who have chosen to incarnate from their starseed self into this life in order to bestow a lot of wisdom on us. You'll be learning and doing meditations with these animals every week. So you come back and get the blessings and the information to start to transform your life. Go to debbiedashinger.com slash shaman. There's an early bird special price right now. And again, it's Debbie, D-E-B-B-I, Dashinger, D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R dot com slash shaman. If you are ready for a vacation that means something, join me. I am speaking on the Galactic Origins Cruise to the Yucatan in December. Unbelievable presenters. I can't wait to hear. And there's just a few cabins left. Also, they've got a special discount right now, ending very, very soon. So definitely reserve your cabin and your experience. Plus, we're visiting sacred sites in the Yucatan. It's debbie-inger.com slash cruise, D-E-B-B-I-D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R.com slash C-R-U-I-S-E, cruise. Well, my guest today is Freddie Silva. He's a best-selling author. He's a leading researcher of ancient civilizations, restricted history, sacred sites, and their interaction with consciousness. He's published nine books in six languages and produced 15 documentaries. Freddie's most recent book is Portals, Energetic Doorways to Mystical Experiences Between Worlds. Described by one CEO as perhaps the best metaphysical speaker in the world right now, Freddie leads sell-out tours to sacred sites worldwide. And for two decades, he has been an international keynote speaker, in addition to appearances on Gaia TV, History Channel, BBC, and countless radio shows such as this one right now. You can learn more about Freddie at invisibletemple.com. And with that, I invite and welcome 
Freddie Silva to Dare to Dream. It's super great to have you here. <laughs> Hello, Debbie. How are you? Very, very well. Where are you from originally? I'll give you three guesses, and it's not my accent. Uh, I was actually born in Portugal. Uh, I moved to London when I was eight, spent half my life there, and then spent the rest of it uh, here in North America. So I'm sort of, um, I don't know, a world citizen. I collect nationalities for a living. Very handy. <laughs> That's great. You've got a try accent there. Um, <laughs> beautiful. And I want to discuss these portals. I love the idea of portals. I think most people love the idea. I know this because they buy books about them in fantasy and they go to movies about them in order to be transported to another world or land or realm. But you actually have experienced them yourself, which makes this way more fascinating. So just for the audience, Freddie, here at the beginning, describe and define what is a portal? What factors define a portal? Yeah, you know, if anybody has actually watched Highlander, which I, I only watched one episode, and I thought, oh dear, um, I actually wrote a, a, a script for uh, the potential of people going to a stone circle and disappearing into another lifetime, mm -hmm. and then it comes out on television. I thought, someone's plagiarizing me from my dreams. But you know what? The reality is actually much closer to, than uh, the fiction because uh, these portals exist all around the planet, and they're literally hotspots where... The laws of physics, as we understand them right now, behave a little bit differently. And wherever the electromagnetic spectrum and the gravitational field change a little bit locally, you, it, your body, because it's essentially electromagnetic, it interacts with these locations, and then you have these extraordinary experiences, if you're open to them, of course. Uh, you can't just go in there as a skeptic and say, I don't believe in this, in which case your body shuts down and you won't. And that's a self-prevention uh, exercise. Uh, but because we've lost that contact throughout the millennia of going to nature and experiencing these uh, directly, our predecessors re recognized that we'd lose this connection and they decided to mark them for us for our daily lives. So those famous temples that you can think of, uh, the Great Pyramid, Stonehenge, anything around the world that has the word sacred on it, they're all built on top of those uh, those portals. And the place where you often find that hot spot of energy eventually becomes called the altar, uh, such as the altar in the Gothic cathedrals that we find throughout Europe, which are built on the old stone circles. So essentially, that's what it, what it is. It's a place where everything becomes much more tangible with the what I call the room next door, what some people call the other world. Mm -hmm. So be careful what you take in them because you might just get back exactly what you requested. Mm, interesting. And so is this something that we here can all experience or does it take a certain kind of personality or way of thinking or being that we would be able to pass through a portal? Oh, it definitely is uh, something for everybody. Uh, there was no hierarchy, but there is uh, there are a couple of parameters that you should be aware of. And that is, First of all, you've got to be mindful of your environment. And most people, you know, especially today with all the, you know, the little rectangles, uh, everybody's attached to uh, like umbilical cords night and day, uh, you tend to uh, sort of lose track of the world around you. And one of the things that I t tell people, in fact, it's a little trick I play on people when they we go off on tour to sacred sites like in Egypt, uh, they want to experience something. And the first thing I'll say is, if you're going to expect uh, experience something, you will. And everybody's very happy. And I said, yeah, it'll come right from you because you want it to happen. That's not what it's about. You have to go there with a certain idea, something that you're looking for, because the portal is a, a living entity in itself. And it's asking, well, what do you want? So you go there with a request, you know, I want to be a better teacher or a better healer, or I want to learn something about the ancient past. And it'll go, okay, we've got something for that. And it'll direct you to a certain location. So you find yourself suddenly going to a different temple that you thought you were. And you forget about your expectation because when you receive something in terms of a coincidence, a dream, uh, sometimes a natural vision or someone actually whispering in your ear, which is what I usually get, and it becomes a foundation for a lot of my research, which I then have to go and back up with actual data and science and so forth. So, you know, to give people a certain idea that it's not coming from my own, my own imagination. Um, if you go there without any expectation, then magic really begins to happen. And I'm speaking from experience. 
And the other thing is that you have to go there almost prepared and be much more open to your environment. Uh, and, and again, a little trick that I play with people, which is name me 10 sounds that you heard in the last 15 minutes. And people will often say, well, a door closing or a bird, and they'll stop right there. And I'll say, go back into the landscape where you came from, go for a walk of 15 minutes and be aware of everything that you hear and i mean everything mm. and you'd be surprised how that simple exercise when they come back and tell me 15 minutes later what they heard they can't stop talking because you can hear the grass growing you can hear crickets yeah. in the next field people putting out a washing line in the uh the, the house next door it's little things like that but what happens is that your aura becomes much more expansive and you're now much more uh, intuitive of your environment and you become sensitive to your environment which of course is the foundation of being psychic. And anybody, uh, everybody is psychic to that degree. It's just the more that you practice it, the more it becomes second nature. So once you get approach these sacred places with that kind of uh, aura extended, then you get much more out of it. Uh, the connection is much more immediate. Amazing. It sounds to me, when I do shamanic energy work, healing work on somebody or on a group, they call what we're doing a hollow bone. That means I completely get out of the way and I let it come through me. You know, anything I think, that's my thought. That's not something that was delivered. But if I uh, remain as neutral as possible, as receptive also as possible, it is unbelievable what comes and what I know to do. I just had a session with somebody today. And in the middle of the these session, even though being, it, it, it would so it's a bit of a time lag. Oh, <laughs> they, usually, they usually call it, the management usually calls you the instrument. That's right. <laughs> Through which it works. That is exactly correct. But it's very powerful when you follow, you let go of protocol and you follow it. And it also sounds to me when you describe this, where you put in a request, so to speak, or an intention, and something is delivered, it's like there's some beautiful library in the sky, if you will, or in the ethers that has um, wisdom that can deliver that to you. And it doesn't matter what you think you need, it will give you what you actually do need. Exactly. Uh, it's what you're looking for. And it could be subconscious, but it's it works better if it's conscious, if you're aware of it. And most of the time, I don't know what I'm looking for in my work. I mean, I kind of follow the trail of ideas and thoughts. And I, I, I used to be very spoiled when I lived in England. Uh, I lived between Avery and Stonehenge, and I was surrounded by giant's graves and things like that. Uh, you can't beat that. And uh, I, yeah, I lived in a, a, a kind of a piss poor cottage, which was, uh, you had to have a fire going in July because it was that cold. But <laughs> apart from that, I go and sit in the afternoon on a giant's grave and go, so what's this about? You know, how can I teach this to people in a way that makes a lot of sense? And I just sit there listening. I didn't really expect anything. I watched the sheep walking by. And before you know it, I'm writing down all these kinds of notes. And I'm thinking, where did this stuff come from? Of course, it's coming from the spirit of place because I put the thought out there that I'm trying to be a better teacher to people. And the best way is to contact the people that built these places in the first place, oh. uh, not from, from academia or anything, because they're so detached from the process. So that's usually my go-to thing is say, what is this all about? expect nothing in return and there's a flood of information and then you spend years researching it and then books come out you know videos come out and that's essentially how the process begins but it literally is interacting with that spirit of place or that holds the knowledge of the land uh, which then takes you to an astral reference library and then all things are possible in fact when i was researching the material for the uh, for this pr current book I was amazed that people like Pythagoras and Plato and even Leonardo da Vinci who were practitioners of this art of going to these portals, uh, which of course in that time are the Greek temples or the Roman temples. And they would go there and, uh, and do exactly what we've done and they come back with these great ideas and we go, well, aren't they really clever? Well, yes, they were, but they also got the idea from another astral reference library and then, then reinterpreted it through their wisdom to give their information to us. Yeah. In your latest book, Portals, Energetic Doorways to Mystical Experiences Between Worlds, you give an analogy, which is to compare a portal to a plank of wood. How is a portal like a plank of wood? <laughs> uh, you've got to sort of look at the plank of wood with all of the little striations on the wood. And then once in a while, you get these knots, okay? And they're beautiful. Once you polish a piece of wood, you get little knots in the actual wood. 
that's the portal in a landscape. Everything looks like it's very normal, but then you get these interruptions in the order of things uh, in, a, in the right way, of course. And then those are the little eddies of energy that we step on them and we go, oh, hello, there's nothing very different here. And anybody that's got their antenna uh, extended will immediately feel this stuff. And uh, it often feels like um, saran wrap, you know, when you're walking into, you know, a, among a landscape and you reach out with your hand and the air is a little, a little bit different. It smells different. It's much thicker. And you put your hand out. It's like touching saran wrap. There's a little film that clings to your uh, the palm of your hand. And you get something called, in very technical terms, the tingly winglies. <laughs> it's essentially you. all your electrical impulses are on the palms of your hand. And this is the most sensitive part of your body. Um, so when you're actually reaching out and you uh, watch what happens to the, the fingertips, you get this sudden tingling sensation. And that's because you're interacting with a different electromagnetic environment. And that goes into your nervous system. And that nervous system then uh, starts to uh, translate the information through the DNA and for the other mechanisms of the body goes to your brain and you get this image or something. It could be a person, an animal. Uh, it could be a color. It depends on what level you are in this term, in this work. Some people can actually see physical beings when they walk into these portals because they're already so well developed. So that's how essentially in terms of the mechanistic uh, concept of nature, how it works. Uh, you're interacting with another level of reality, but it goes through your fiber system and then it develops into an image. Mm-hmm. So you mentioned earlier Outlander, of course, that was a series of books I read many years ago, then they made it into this incredible, they did such a good job with the TV show. Um, the final season was, I think it was last year. Oh, really? <laughs> it's a big deal, yeah, to open us up to right that idea. And you also mentioned, Freddie, you speak from experience. So will you share with the audience what was it like for you the first time that you had an interaction with a portal? What occurred and what was that like for you? <laughs> it was quite funny because, I mean, I've been drawing pyramids when I was three and I, looking back on my life and no one in my family knew what this was all about. I had to wait till I'm in my late 20s before I met people who would then tell me that my impressions of the landscape are much more intuitive than most people uh, because I'm just born that way. Uh, but no one bothered to tell me. But my grandmother was very intuitive. So I kind of I had a foot in the other world already. I just didn't know how to interpret the whole thing. And then one day when I was getting very curious and in the middle of when I was doing crop circle research in England and uh, wrote a book on it, uh, which is now 20 years old, which is incredible. And uh, I was I began to get, take much a deeper interest in the stone structures like Stonehenge and things like that. And my first trip to Stonehenge was with a great friend of mine who's a great psychic uh, and also a great astro astrologer and an accountant. So she knows how to use the left brain and the right brain really well. And uh, she'd take me in there without really telling me what was going to happen. And it was at night. And this was back in the day where you get private access without much uh, commotion. And uh, you'd pay about $5 or, or six pounds. And uh, you have an hour to yourself. And about nine o'clock at night in Stonehenge, it's absolutely dead quiet. You're inside there, a little mist coming down. And she would say to me, well, I'm going to go and collect my messages, uh, and uh, which, is, which she means her downloads. And uh, because you're in a field of energy, which is much thinner, so it's much easier to get a good download in places like that. And she said to me, why don't you go and, uh, you know, find that, ask yourself what, what, why, what you are here. You know, what brought you to Stonehenge? And then one of the stones will talk to you. And I went, okay, that sounds a little bit weird. Uh, crazy lady <laughs> in a good way. And I go off and wander around. And I go, yeah, I wanted to find out who was behind this and why did people build this? And suddenly there's a stone on the corner of Stonehenge looking at me going, wait, psst, come over here. And I said, did I just see that? So I went over. It's like a dog, you know, going to the fire hydrant. And uh, I sat down, put my back to the stone. And the next thing I know, there's a guard behind me whispering, saying, well, um, as soon as you're done, come back over to the hut. We'll make a nice cup of tea. And I opened my eyes and I said, look, we've got an hour here. Oh, we gave you an extra hour. You've been here for two hours. I literally shut my eyes for five seconds. I was gone with the fairies, literally. And I remember getting this incredible vision of some big humanoid with what looked like these appendages behind him, um, giving me this sword, except the sword was a flame. 
And I didn't think twice about it. I wasn't scared or anything. It was like a normal excursion. And then afterwards, we were out to have dinner. And Jane, my friend, said, so did you have any interesting experiences while we were there for two hours? I said, well, first of all, it took five seconds, and then the guard was there. I can't believe we were out for two hours. But the weird things, there was this big guy. It looked like he had his two appendages in the back of his, uh, uh, you know, behind him. And he gave me this this sword, and the sword was on fire. And she goes, that was your first experience? And Stonehill said, yeah. And next day, we wouldn't have tea with another really phenomenal psychic. I mean, it's been in her family for generations. She helps the police with their inquiries, and she's become a great friend of mine ever since and a great teacher. And uh, the two of them sat down and says, do you know what happened to this guy on his first visit to Stonehenge? What? He gets given the sword of light by the archangel Michael. And she looks at me because that happened to you. I said, what the hell is going on? Who is this Michael, this Mickey guy? And she says, that's Michael to you, the archangel Mikael. You got your work cut out for you, young man. And I had no idea at that moment what I, my subconscious had asked for because that's what I came here to do. And I was completely unaware of it. And within weeks, my marriage of 14 years is gone. My house is gone. My sports car is gone. Lost my cats. Moved back. Sold everything. Lost a lot of my friends. They thought I'd gone completely nuts. And I began to write down what became uh, um, an international bestseller, which is the book on crop circles, and then the books on sacred space that followed after that. And I've been on a 30-year tour, and I had no idea this is what's going to be happening to me in my life. And I love it. I absolutely adore what I'm doing because it was my calling. It was in my blood, but it had to. I had to give them that push over the edge with a personal experience to really understand what was going on and tell people that this is what happens in sacred space, if you just allow it, something magical really does happen, and then your life changes for the better. Doesn't mean it's going to get better in terms of the uh, the uh, uh, hurdles. You still will get hurdles to improve you as a person. Uh, but the thing is, hopefully, at the end of the experiences, and I had a lot of experiences, um, you come out of it a better person, and that's what it's about. It's be- making you real- realize the purpose of the soul that's in this body and what you came here to do. And if you can do that in one lifetime, you've done really well. Oh, I agree with you so much. That's a profound story because at a juncture such as you describe when your new friends are telling you, my God, that was Archangel Michael. He was handing a torch over to you to carry on down a very specific path. People could have made many different choices should they have had the same experience. But the fact that, wow, those are significant changes that you allowed to happen in order to pursue what you say your soul came here to do. Yeah. And, I'm and you have proud to have a certain of you. Of trust. You have to have a certain amount of trust and uh, no fear, obviously. If you take fear in with you, you're lost. First thing you learn is control fear and emotion. Trust the process because after a while, uh, and don't take it for granted, obviously, but trust the process because it's there to guide you. We all have uh, these potentials sitting and waiting to help us. We have to ask for that help. If we don't ask for help, they're not going to inter- intervene in your life. And that's another thing that I've learned as well. You've got to learn to ask. And then it happens in mysterious ways. You might get levitated in a crop circle. And yes, that's happened to me as well. You might see people coming out of stones, and I've seen those coming out of the Great Pyramid on several occasions, as have the people that have joined me on tours. It depends on where you are and what you come here to do, but you have to ask for help because you've got so many people helping you in the other world, and they're saying, we know how difficult it is to be in the physical world. We've done it, and uh, we're not going back uh, because we know it is difficult and it's challenging, but we've done it. We got the T-shirt and now we're helping people like yourself. Uh, but you've got to ask us to to intervene on your behalf because that's the way it works. So, yeah, don't be shy about asking for help. Uh, and then be careful what you ask for because you will get it. Yeah, very powerful. I'm going, by the way, to Stonehenge. I'm speaking in Glastonbury. I'm flying there in a month to speak oh. at an event. And it's so interesting. I never even thought about this. It's called Portals to ascension, (laughs) whole world. But I'm very excited about- That's a very good title. (laughs) Yes, it is, considering our talk, and maybe I will meet you in a portal. But we do plan to go to sacred sites, and um, I'm really excited to experience the energy there in that town of King Arthur, of Mary Magdalene, whatever else is there to experience 
So I'm so glad you told this, your first story. And I relate a lot to what you just said, incredibly so. For me, it was a shaman path. Mm. Last thing ever on the planet. I mean, maybe not ever. Maybe plumber would have been ever. But (laughs) I had an experience. And in my case, it was plant medicine. And I went in there seeking healing many, many years ago. I did it four nights in a row back to back. And I had a profound experience where I was spoken to and told who I am. You're a shaman. You're a healer. You're a priestess. And I'm like, no, (laughs) I'm not. I argued because it was so strange to me. And the divine came back every night and showed me different pieces and glimpses of myself. And thank God when I confused, came back to my life, had some very gifted friends who were able to help. And it's been a long journey for me to be where I am today. And now I'm a practicing shamanic healer and I speak about this plus extraterrestrials. It's been a profound journey, but I also am so glad I said in my very confused way, okay, yes, and have been led here. So to that end, I want to go into this because you bring this up in your book, which is like, this is beautiful, the information you give in your book. So here's a quote from your portals book, Freddie, which is to our predecessors and today's living shamans, portals assist the enlightenment of the individual by providing a more direct conduit to an astral reference library, much like what you described in your story or the means to communicate with other entities, be they alive or long since dissolved. So Mm -hmm. I am interested in the shamanic aspect of this. Have you known shamans who utilize these portals? Oh, absolutely. I mean, this one of the things that you do uh, when, and especially when you, you kind of don't have the confidence or you kind of have too much head stuff going on, the idea is to go into the landscape and go to the sacred places. I mean, even the Knights Templar were being told to venerate the sacred places, and a lot of them gave up soldiery in order to become hermits and become very spiritual people. Uh, not a lot of people know that. And the idea was to find those ancient places of veneration because they were built there to mark those specific spots on the land where the contact point between you and the rest of the universe is much thinner. So you're kind of helping yourself in a way to get out of your own head and go to these sites, stand on these sites, and the process is much, much simpler. And Britain is actually a very good example. Uh, I mean, I know people in Cornwall and Devon that still go out there uh, very regularly to the stone circles because they're not very well visited in Devon and Cornwall. There are not many motorways that go out there. Uh, So Glastonbury, of course, everybody goes up the tour, and sometimes they make a mess of it too. Uh, I mean, energy is just energy. It doesn't give a damn one way or the other. It's what you take there that either accentuates it or it pollutes it. So sometimes groups that I belong to uh, around the world go around to these sacred places and clean up the mess that certain people leave behind and neutralize it, bring it back to its original purpose. Uh, And since you brought up Glastonbury, there is a, a, a mirror image of Glastonbury five miles down the road. It's called Barrow Mump. Hardly anyone goes there. So if you want a nice, quiet place to do the same work that you will do on Glassbury Tour without anyone bothering you, you go to Barrow Mump. And there's a very nice pub at the bottom of the hill as well, just to, or we call it a research center as well. Which is <laughs> That's great. <laughs> uh, yeah, people you still use it all the time. And, and and Native America as well, there's a hill outside of Santa Fe called Sikumu. And uh I often tell this to people and they'll go out there. They're expecting some big temple and they're totally disappointed when they get to the summit. They're just a pile of rocks. Well, that pile of rocks marks exactly where the portal is for people who can't sense it and they can't see it. So they'll write back and they'll say, well, I was a bit disappointed. I traveled all the way to Santa Fe. There was no nothing to take pictures of. I said, but that's the point. The point is to experience the pure energy of this summit, which is where the local tribe, the Tewa, still used to this very day. Uh, so they are everywhere. Uh, there's even, for example, right now in my uh, uh, apartment, there's only one place where I can put my computer and do my work. There's only one place happens to coincide with a telluric current that flows through the building that goes to an original portal just a block away where the local Native American tribe used to have their sacred site. And I used to live there. I used to rent a a room there before I bought this place. So I'm literally using the same portal to help me. And then my work also helps the portal. It's a two-way street. So sometimes it's very difficult to uh, get any sleep here because 
part of the line goes right through my head in my my bedroom. And there are days here where you just, you, you have to take uh, something to sleep because your mind is working overtime because you're feeding off the energy, which is electromagnetic. So it's still used today everywhere around the, the planet, even downtown in New York. Um, people say, well, I wish I was in the middle of the countryside. I said, well, you can go up the Hudson River and look for these places where people have built these sort of underground little caverns made of made of stone. They're all along the Hudson, and they've been found to be highly electromagnetic as well. Well, that's what they were used for. But if you walk around downtown, around Rockefeller Plaza, watch what happens to your body when you're walking mindfully. There are certain parts around there, specific buildings, like the Chrysler Building, for example, I love going there, not just for the um, the dynamics of the building, but because whoever built that knew about that block and what's under the building. There's a natural hot spot that vibrates up the building, and that's why people love going there. Who Certain built places, these? Are, oh, these absolutely, Native Americans absolutely. Who built yeah, them? around Rockefeller Plaza, where you have a lot of Masonic symbolism, and despite mm -hmm. what you might think of uh, masonry, there is Scottish right Freemasonry, right. and then there's the people who are trying to take over the world. Those are not the people we're talking about. We're talking about the original Masons who were the Knights Templar, who were the Essenes. They're the same tradition. And they built these places exactly where you want them to be in the middle of these urban environments because they knew what was there. They chose that, that landmark to put a building there. And if you got your eyes on the on the prize you look up one floor above downtown Manhattan, there are certain symbols in certain buildings, and you'll go, Aha, I know exactly where I am. And then you stand there looking like a complete idiot as people are walking by, and you're getting completely entranced by these hotspots of energy literally coming out of the ground. So they are everywhere. And there's one uh, glacial erratic in Central Park overlooking the, the big lake. It's got all these scratches from the glaciers. That's also on a hotspot as well. It's a naturally occurring hotspot. So they're a bit like the meridians in your body. We have thousands of meridians in our body, which help us calibrate ourselves to ourselves and our environment. It's the same with the planet Earth as well. Some are, are much more fine-tuned. Some have been laid fallow because they've been let go for a long period of time. But the places which are active uh, are usually marked by ancient sacred places or ancient temples. And people who go there to deliver their prayers, they leave a little bit of their light in the building so that the next people that come along pick up that light. And that's how we keep nurturing these portals. It's a bit like watering a plant. The more you water it with your uh, affirmation, the more the portal keeps growing. So that's uh, that's how it goes. Wow. Thank you for that. I love those details you shared. Very exciting. I'm originally from New York. I do go back periodically. And now I will do so with a completely different eye and choice of experience. It's really fascinating. For someone like me, anybody who's listening, who's going somewhere in the world where globally there is a porthole or portholes, what do you suggest we do? What are some of the steps so that we can have uh, an experience, a portal experience? And then how do we come back? <laughs> <laughs> well, if you want to come back, um, there are people who, I have to say, uh, going back to um, the Highlander, there are a couple of I mean, of Outlander. Cases. The... Sorry, Outlander, Outlander. Mm -hmm. Yeah, two very different things. <laughs> um, there was one case I know where someone physically went through the portal and disappeared, came back two days later, completely discombobulated. And it happened in Lake Titicaca. There's a, a hillside which has a portal in the shape of a T. It's a forced door. It's about two feet deep. Uh, and I've been there on many occasions. You don't want to go there during the sunset because you get pulled right into it. It uh, can be quite dangerous if you don't know what you're doing. But nothing untoward is going to happen. It'll just frighten the hell out of you. Um, someone actually physically got pulled in there, came back two days later. And the villagers, they know this because it's part of their folklore. It happened about five years ago, uh, just before COVID. And about a week before I went there as well. So I like to go there in, in the uh, the daytime. Uh, it's called Amuru Muru. And it means the old... Uh, the portal of the old bearded man of Mu, or Lemuria, as we call it. And it's a very, very powerful raw energy place. So the trick to, when you go to these places is, again, go there and become much more sensitive to your environment when you when you go there. So do my little, uh, my seven steps, which I actually put in the back of the book, which is one reason why I really wanted to write this, because it was practical magic. There's something you can actually do to empower yourself and make the best of your time at these places. And uh, I've said before, expectation. Let go of the expectation. 
if you expect something to happen, it will happen and it will be your ego talking back to you and you're back where you started. Don't worry about it. These things happen in their own time. Uh, become much more aware by being aware of sounds, every sound around you. And when you do that, your vision starts to expand as well. Mm -hmm. And you might get lucky on your first visit and you might see some unusual creature standing there looking at you and saying, oh, you can see me. And you go, yeah. And that's when you know something weird has happened. Uh, that used to happen to me in Ireland when I was learning my craft, uh, again, with a group of people who were also doing the same thing. And uh, we were cleansing the energy of an old mound where the Catholic Church had uh, built a cemetery. So there's discombobulated people in there that don't realize that they're actually dead. So we're helping them. At the end of it, I felt I had my hands sort of on my side and I felt someone pulling my hand. And I pulled up this creature that looked like this strange onion head with a big protruding belly with little tiny little slivers of matchsticks for feet. And I said, what the hell are you? And it started complaining. I had to put him down. I mean, it's like, oh, he's got a bit of an ego. <laughs> he's very proud. And uh, my channel, a friend, was laughing her head off. And the rest of the group was saying, what are you laughing at? And I said, well, can't you see this guy? He's like a little spirit that's here. That's not what they look like in real life. They just pr project that into our consciousness so we can become comfortable with it, something that will make sense to us. Because if, we, if they were to show themselves in a way that they really look like in the other reality, we, we'd run a mile because it would be weird. We have no mental construct of what they look like. So they present themselves in an unusual way, but still kept following me, kept holding my finger all the way up to the edge of the perimeter of the energy field, and then, boof, disappeared like a puff of smoke. Um, so, and again, it was just going there with your with your energy field much more open, much more sensitive, hearing everything, trying to see much more beyond your peripheral vision, and you become much more aware this is actually happening. And if you do it enough, like driving your car, it becomes second nature. You'll see these things crossing your living room sometimes, which is very disconcerting. But there's nothing to be worried about because you can't be. Uh, you can't be interacted with unless you're given permission to. And you certainly cannot attract anything untoward unless you want that to happen. And some people do want to work with the dark side of nature because that's what they're looking for. And then again, be careful what you ask for because you might get it and it might be a bit beyond your control. So don't worry about you know what's coming towards you because if you don't take the fear there, then you're okay. Mm -hmm. And then there's other things like fasting as well. Take as less of your body as you can into these places uh, you know, eat less meat for a little bit. And speaking as a, a meat eater, that's taking quite a bit of a risk. Uh, I'll have my vegetables, drink lots of water and become a bit more light body because that helps the process as well. So there are all these little things that I teach uh, in the third part of the book as to how you can actually make the best, excuse me, of your time in sacred space because you want to make the best of it, uh, especially if you live far away from these places. Yes, absolutely. You put something on social media recently um, on your, I think it was your Facebook page, which read, perhaps we have become soft as a species. Consider that in 12th century, it was common practice to take a trip with a dragon as your emotional support animal. That's so beautiful. <laughs> Is there anything you can say in earnest about historical dragons? And have you had any real experiences with them? Oh, I hate snakes. <laughs> I don't know. I'm the worst person to talk about this. But uh, I, I am curious, though. I mean, it's one of those little side projects that I have. I don't really plan my life in what I'm going to write. It comes to me in strange ways, and I go, that's interesting. And if it gets my interest, I'll go and start researching it and yeah. spend the next five years putting something together. But dragons have been on my periphery because they keep popping up. And the metaphorical version of the dragon, of course, is the symbol for earth energy, uh, because earth energy behaves like a serpent or a dragon flowing through the landscape. And uh, where dragon has the wings. So, of course, the metaphor is that when you step on one of these dragons on the landscape, you're stepping on a line of electromagnetic current that gives you wings. It allows you to fly into a different level of reality. That's from the metaphorical angle. But my question is, and I still haven't got an answer to it yet, I guess because I haven't pursued it enough, but now that we're talking about it, it might be my next project. You never know how these things happen. Where did we get the concept of a dragon in the first place? I mean, we can only build from reality. Uh, and if there were at one point creatures that resembled dragons, and uh, certainly there is, there's many indications from China that these things did exist, mm -hmm. they may have been part of a species related to dinosaurs that survived 
and the extinction of the dinosaurs. I mean, we have not, we still don't know everything about the earth there is to know. So I would not be surprised, but it would be fun as a project to go back in time to find out where these things come from. Uh, they tend to sort of materialize in the Far East or in what used to be Persia. That seems to be the longest uh, tradition of dragons. And then they, they go into Europe in the Middle Ages with the uh, the Gaelic people. And then, of course, Scotland and Ireland uh, are famous. And, and England, of course, very famous for their connections to dragons. So I think there must have been a connection to a physical experience at some point a long, long time ago. But again, I have to go and walk about and ask very old people in very strange places, you know, what do you recollect when your grandparents were telling you about dragons? And one of them will say something to me about, oh, because we used to know about these things because they were real at one point. And then, of course, they died out because of something, because they were hunted or whatever. So at the, at the core of the story, I'm sure there is a nugget of truth that these things did exist in reality at one point. I'm deeply into them. I have a really huge white onyx dragon head that sits on my altar looking after me and a much smaller one. Um mean of labradorite and yeah i feel very drawn i actually feel like one of my spirit animals is a dragon and most of my power animals are all fierce they're all very ferocious so i receive it and i feel like they're here to protect me but i would love to see a book on that just say it i mean there's a few ones that i've sort of scoured in the in all actually in the old bookstores in glastonbury uh take a suitcase with you because two bookstores there that specialize in used books and uh you will not leave and without filling a suitcase half of my library comes from uh uh the speaking tree and the uh the, the place next door and you'll be there for hours and be careful what you ask for, because that book will be waiting when you get there. And a couple of them were about dragons, about people trying to make sense of the mythology behind them. But that's about as far as they took it. So maybe it is time to start doing a bit of research. So I'm going to make a mental note on this. And uh, we'll, we'll get back in touch in a year from now and see how it's coming along. Oh, absolutely. I would love that. I know so many people in my tribe who are deeply into dragons. A lot of people who speak on stages, much like you, who are very committed and, and believe in and have experience with um, some in the psychic way. But it's it's a big, very profound conversation. And I've always, I get very bummed out when I see that dragons, especially in movies and TV, they're portrayed as these, these horrible uh, fear mongering, you know, just out to kill dragons. Yeah. And I don't believe at all that's who they are. Maybe some of them, you know, there's good, bad and everything, but I believe very strongly they have deep wisdom, deep medicine and magic. And mm. when they get fierce, it's that they are protecting someone or something. But I, I have found them energetically anyway, quite gentle and loving unless someone wants to mess with me. Exactly. So I'd love to see that from... book. <laughs> It all comes from the Catholic Church uh, in Europe mm -hmm. when they were trying to get rid of all of this pagan mumbo-jumbo because uh, the pagan mumbo-jumbo was very real for thousands of years to most people. And they found dragons to be basically a metaphor for the earth energy, but they also felt that there was something much more tangible as a creature that would help them uh, as a totem animal, and it would not go away. So the idea came up that where they would have St. George or St. Michael uh, back to that guy again, spearing the dragon uh, in order to sh uh, basically tell everybody in Europe, oh, no, we killed the old religion, and now you have to come to church and listen to what we have to tell you. Well, the thing is, if you look at some of the oldest traditions of dragon slaying, the dragon's not being slayed at all. And I found one carving at the Temple of Edfu in Egypt where the dragon and even the snake, they're being harnessed. You can see the spear going into the mouth, but it's not piercing the actual animal. And there's the metaphor. It's about harnessing the energy which behaves on the landscape just like a dragon or a serpent. And that's where you realize, oh, I'm standing on a location where this used to be taught, was practiced, or where the energy is actually flowing. And not far from, uh, in fact, a short drive from Glastonbury to Wells, if you go to the chapter house, which you should do first thing in the morning before it opens up, you go to the chapter house and hardly anybody goes in there. And I don't know why. That's on a portal. That's on a hotspot. And it was built there by people who understand what we're talking about. The geometry of the room is absolutely perfect. And it has the symbol of the risen Osiris, the pillar. It's like a palm tree dressed in stone. 
But in there, you'll find before you get in there, there are two protective images that go up this beautiful curving staircase. And look at them closely. There's two monks either side of the staircase, and they have sticks. And the stick is going into the mouths of two coiled serpents. And you think, now, why are those two on either side of the, um, the staircase? It's like they're protecting a gateway. Well, they are. Because if you go there as a dowser or you take expensive electromagnetic equipment, you'll find that there's a current riding up that staircase that go coils like a serpent inside that chapter house. And it was used for out-of-body ceremonies by people who, well, uh, who discussed the very things that were describing in this program. Still very active to this very day, by the way. And I, uh, I would urge you to do a little bit of toning very quietly in that room. It's one of the most acoustically perfect rooms on the planet next to the uh, the king's chamber in the great pyramid uh, that's an, another one i can think of that's very acoustically well tuned so the chapter house in wells uh, it gets into an out of body experience in seconds and i've done it this to people in my groups uh, i've had people there who do tibetan polyphonic singing joining in mm -hmm. and the acoustics are just magical you're literally leaving the body as you're sitting there turning and before you realize it three hours have gone by and then you got people telling you to leave the room because another tour group coming in and you're going, oh, sorry, I thought I was here for five minutes. Oh, my gosh. I'm, I'm the world is a wonderful place. You just have to go out there and experience it. Absolutely. And it's nice to know these wonderful places to go to. So important. And I now have a list. Thank you for that. I'll be there <laughs> before the event and after the event. So I'll have time to do things on my own besides the tours that the group will do. Um, Freddie, you brought up earlier Scotland, and I wanted to talk a little bit about that. Can you elaborate on the significance of Scotland's sacred sites and how they relate to ancient global spiritual practices? Yeah, that was a sort of a project that came out of the woodwork. And uh, I kept taking people to Scotland for many years, uh, just six people. I was the driver, uh, which is very dangerous. Uh, and uh, we go into all kinds of places and nooks and crannies, on, especially on the islands of the West Coast, where most people can't go, or tour buses definitely cannot go. And I began to question the origin of these sacred sites of Scotland. And they have some of the oldest standing stones and stone circles uh, in, in Europe, if not the British Isles. It turns out that the, uh, the whole megalithic structure of the British Isles came from the Scottish Isles, from the West Coast of Ireland inside not up through europe and i want to know how and uh, quite by coincidence uh, again the management putting things into my head i began I, I i befriended a master of the armenian language vahan satyan a lovely man and uh i didn't realize he was a fan of my work and i began to learn armenian through his structural uh, exercises and i began to decipher all the places in scotland because no one knows what these places are called. So, for example, if you go to Orkney, which has the, uh, the stone circles of Brogard and Stennis, two of the most powerful places on the planet, I love them up there, uh, I began to realize that these names are actually Armenian in origin, and they tell you exactly what took place there. So I began to put one and one together and uh, literally go back backwards in time and uh, back engineer the sacred sites of Scotland and Ireland and found out that the language fingerprint is Armenian and it moved there in 6,000 BC all the way across Europe uh, during another major climatic change that happened around then. Uh, so all the customs and traditions of what used to be the Tuar de Danu, who were the divine bloodline of uh, Eastern Europe, who go back to the Anunnaki of Armenia and Sumeria, who then became the divine bloodline of Ireland, the Tuatha de Danan. Same word, just a different reiteration because of the linguistic change over time. Uh, and that became the foundation for the, uh, the book of Scotland's Hidden Sacred Past, of understanding the geometry, the layout of the landscape, what these sites were referring to. And we used to think it was the sun and the moon, and to most extents they are. But all of them reference this first risings of the belt stars of Orion, just like they do in Egypt. And there's another connection with the uh, divine bloodline of Egypt as well. So we're now in historical times looking at people who have been kicked out of Europe because of the extended religious practices. And they're finding a foothold at the very northwestern corner where they're allowed to practice uh, their uh, uh, system of uh, measure, system of looking at the sky and drawing the energy of the stars to the ground, and then teaching people about the mysteries of life. 
uh, to what became known as the the Druidic culture. So it's a wonderful story, and I didn't see it coming, and no one's ever written about it. So it was a eight year exercise in listening to the landscape, hearing the the spirit of place, putting ideas into my head, and I write these things down and go, well, how can I prove this without people thinking I've gone mad? Because my job is to convince skeptics to come into the conversation. Otherwise, it's it's easy convincing people who really believe in this. I want to bring in more people to understand what we're talking about. And then, of course, it's eight years of research. Uh, But it all starts with that connection of going to these portals and saying, well, where does this come from? And boom, in comes the the information. You just got to hear. Who would have thought Armenian language in Scotland, especially with, I've, I've lived in Scotland before when I was a performer and they have such a distinct accent. <laughs> there is no doubt. Oh, and noticed? they're delightful people. <laughs> but that's incredible. History is incredible and how people without the transportation means that we have today were yeah. able to get around the world as they did. But very much what you said, about religious practices and maybe agriculture and astronomy and so forth that, you know, people would shift where they lived globally, depending on where they could practice being themselves yeah. without being persecuted for it. They got around much more than we give them credit for. And the story actually picks up in Easter Island in New Zealand, uh, which is something I'm now working on. Yeah, I had no idea that Armenian language ends up in New Zealand with one of its original cultures, which is not the Maori, by the way. These people were there thousands of years before the Maori. And their famous place names, and there's some incredible landscape temples down there, uh, which I thought were Maori names. It turns out they're Armenian names in origin. And uh, they've can trace their bloodline back to Armenia, thousands of years ago, and that's not been written yet. It's It has to come from their tribe first before I can publish it as part of the uh, the decorum. Uh, it's uh, a matter of respect for the local culture. So that's something that's also brewing up as a result of what I've discovered in Scotland, just putting one and one together. But again, they were saying that the Egyptians were also traveling the Pacific because they were great seafarers. And I heard that story in South America and uh, people like Vita Kosha and his seven helpers who are called the Hai Hai Wapanti. And I thought, well, what does that mean in Aymara? And they said, it means shining people. I said, well, wait a minute. You just told me that these are the same people as the followers of Horus, the shining ones, who are also in a group of seven who also had one charismatic leader that led them. And he was married to the only woman in the group. And they said, yeah. <laughs> completely matter of fact. And I thought, so the Egyptians were in South America? Oh, yeah. They used to go all the way across the Pacific thousands of years ago during the end of the Ice Age. Uh, and at that point, you just shut up and you listen, you take notes, because these people, their predecessors were around uh, when uh, we were still scavenging for uh, roots in Europe at the end of the Ice Age. So who are we, you know, with all the academia in Europe to write the history of the world when these people in some parts of the world, their ancestors were closer to the events than we are. So why not hear what they have to say? Yes. And you mentioned that you are... Your, your predominant expertise is in crop circles, which is an amazing, fascinating subject. It oh, yeah. mystifies people. Um, there's not always answers for a lot of what we see, but it's very clear what we're seeing may not be made by humans. So what for you, Freddie, are some of the most intriguing patterns or messages that you found in crop circles? Oh, have you got five hours? I do. <laughs> For you, I, I do. I, I actually reprinted uh, the, uh, the my first book. It was an international bestseller uh, because it went out of print and people were swapping copies at $400 uh, copy on eBay. And I said, wow. well, I'm not making a penny out of that. And I don't want people to pay that kind of money. And it's had the resurgence. Uh, most of the stuff since 2003 has been man-made. I, I'm sorry to say that, but it is true. Uh, it was a conversation. And the conversation began in the uh, 19th century, uh, not the 20th century. Uh, it, it was very sporadic. But it was only around the uh, end of the 1970s that they began to really pop up uh, in Britain. And then they spread around the world. And uh, up until the start of hoaxing, which really only began around 1991, when things got out of control, and it was becoming a religion. Uh, the British uh, uh, Secret Service, MI6, paid two guys to go out and tell the world that they made everything, which is complete nonsense because the, there was three crop circles appearing on the same night in three different countries. So if they made all of them, I want to investigate them because I want to know how to time travel. 
and be in several places at the same time making crop circles. But the nuts and bolts of it, it was a, it was a consciousness, a universal consciousness, which actually links back to the uh, Egyptian followers of Horus, the Shining Ones, who are now no longer in physical body. They're part of what we call our archangels, our helpers, our guides in the next reality. And they're saying, uh, we needed to let you know that you're in deep doo-doo. Uh, the planet is in deep doo-doo and humanity is facing near extinction. And we've had the call for help from people around the world saying we need some assistance to help us overcome this incredible hurdle that we're in right now. Uh, climate change is only the tip of the troubles that we're in. And there is a, a there is a happy ending, or should I say a potentially happy ending, which I'm not going to ruin it for you because it is in the book. And um, it's all to do with putting information into the Earth's energy grid using the visual beauty of crop circles to get people interested and get their attention. And those who, again, have their antenna extended and they go in there, they'll say, this is interesting. And once you show an interest, they've got your phone number and your address. And, of course, they use people like me, little did I know, to write a book to tell the world what it's all about. And a lot of the early circles, they contain information that we already knew about through indigenous people. And in fact, it was the indigenous cultures that helped us decipher the early crop circles because they said, oh, we, these exist in petroglyphs. And I remember a lot of the Hopi uh, wisdom keepers saying, yeah, we have these near first mesa in, in Arizona. This is what this means. And as soon as we understand the basic alphabet, we could start deciphering with the rest of the language. Now, a lot of the symbols are subconscious. They work through your, you into DNA. And there's uh, evidence to show that there is. And a lot of them are also uh, mathematical. There are new mathematical theorems for the first time in, what, two and a half thousand years that have come out. And there's the blueprints for an energy device. And I can say, uh, without naming names, because this is very, very touchy subjects for people who are developing alternate energy. And you know what I'm saying? Like the guy who invented the car that runs on hydrogen in Seattle brings it out onto the news. And next day, he gets run over by his own vehicle twice. Isn't that incredible? Uh, so these people who developed uh, the design on the cover of my book, and I put that design on the cover of the book for a reason, because I knew what it was going to do. I just couldn't say it to anybody because they have to figure out the information. Three groups of scientists in England, America, and Australia have built that design in 3D and said it defies gravity. And what we were told originally through the channel medium was that that particular design has a, an energy imprint and a technological uh, printout that will help you get away from fossil fuels, which is part of your problem right now. And lo and behold, we have three groups of scientists that validate the channeling and the crop circle information as well. So that's just an inkling of what's behind this. It's real magic. And people have actually made a lifetime of actually deciphering this, applying the information with healing, by the way. There's a healing modality involved in the crop circles too. Uh, you have to go on my website for that because it's a long, long story. Uh, and um, people are also experiencing incredible heating modalities as a result of the energy that's transferred through these designs. So it's the most important phenomenon. Uh, but the, here's the, the, the thing. They behave exactly like a portal, like an ancient temple. They're just made with flattened crop. Uh, and that's the beauty of the story, that we've stopped building sacred sites in the last 2,000 years. And now this entity, this consciousness, is making these new uh, sacred sites for us on the planet. So it's all coming around full circle. So there is good news and a silver lining to all of this. What about, have you ever investigated the Nazca lines in Peru? Oh God, yeah, and I've got nowhere. <laughs> I know I think it's Maria a big Rilke yes. got closest to it. I think she's, I mean, she lived there for what, 40 years? Uh, so kudos to her. It's not exactly a nice place to live. Uh, and uh, I think she got as about as close as you can possibly get They're to do with uh, projections of the sky on the ground. And there are certain astrological markings which show that if you follow the trajectory of the patterns, there is a mirror in the sky. And that helps you to some degree to date them. But there are five different levels of interpretation because they've been built over many thousands of years. And you can tell, they can, you can actually figure out which groups belong to which group uh, because it it depends on the level of how much the ground has been scratched. Uh, they are literally made by someone walking the ground and uh, scratching the very thin layer of rust. Believe it or not, you're walking on rust. It's the, um, uh, uh, the metal that's uh, oxidized in the limestone on the ground. And as soon as you remove that level of red, 
the white layer comes up from below. Uh, so the, uh, you can tell there are certain groups which were, be, which were designed much more recently and some which are much older, and they fall into certain categories. And the ones that kind of resemble animals to, uh, tend to be the middle group. The linear patterns tend to be the much older, and they seem to be projecting to positions on the landscape which reveal the ascension of certain constellations. So I'm pretty sure that that's what it was all about. But as to why they did it, uh, no one really knows. It's, it is one of the last remaining mysteries, I have to say. Uh, but I think Maria probably got uh, closer than anybody else that I know. Mm. Wow, I have so many questions for you. It's <laughs> your font. It is. This is incredible for me. It's the rabbit hole. It's like this. More, more. I'm at the buffet. Mm. I'm going to keep getting dishes. Oh, it's like a drug. It really is. I mean, I haven't stopped in 30 years. I literally, I've, I've had one vacation in 30 years of touring. Uh, and I guess my job is my, my vocation is my vacation. Yeah. And uh, thank you to the American tax system because I can write it off legally. Uh, you know, this is why I have to move countries. I can actually do what I do from here rather than being back home and going to the pub every day. Uh, it's life. Okay, so the sh sh I'll say this, my French is awful, but Chartres, Chartres uh, Cathedral, that is a place that's revered for its architecture, for its spiritual significance. What hidden or unconventional elements have you uncovered about the cathedral, the cathedral in your research, Freddie? Oh, I've got a book for that as well. Um, I got kicked out of Chartres Cathedral for leading an unconventional tour. In other words, mm. we weren't talking about Christian things, except we were talking about Christian things. We just weren't talking about Catholic things. And Catholicism and Christianity are two very different things altogether. Uh, Jesus practiced Christianity. Catholicism is a perversion of that story, and we won't even go there. The whole building is a huge sermon in stone. You have to start with the uh, – mathematically, if you were – a uh, musician, you'd go there and look at the proportions of how things are placed um, architecturally, and you find music scale everywhere, and that's what gives it its timber. So when you go there quietly at night and you get uh, special access and you tone in there using Gregorian chants, uh, what Russian scientists found in the 90s is that when you measure your brainwave patterns using a certain type of Gregorian chant, your brainwaves go 4,000% above normal waking states. You literally are close to God at that point. And the building is doing that for you. But also, it's built on five layers of original temples. There's an original passage mound in the very foundation of the building. And if you pay someone a lot of money, you'd probably be able to get in there. And I've got the actual blueprint from a uh, survey that was done in the 50s after an earthquake by an architectural group to validate the insurance for the building to make sure it wasn't going to fall down. Today, they won't tell you uh, that there's such a thing under the building, and yet there's a proof. They don't want to talk about this pagan stuff. So the energy is literally under the altar itself, and the, the horseshoe and the alignment is the mirror image of Stonehenge in Britain across the water, by the way. Uh, there are all of these things that you can look just on the outside of the building. If you're looking at things in terms of metaphor with the mysteries, there are certain symbols, certain people etched into the building. And if you've got your eye out, uh, and especially the northeast quadrant, which is the most profound, and the northeast direction is always the, uh, the direction of the mystic. So you'll find all the mysteries of life in the northeast quadrant, including on the back of a pillar, which is the hardest part to see, of the last part you get to see in the building. Because you've got to make, you've got to work for this, by the way. You've got to really work hard to find the clues to the mysteries. You'll find the Ark of the Covenant on the back of the uh, the building in a very quiet little spot. And again, hardly anyone even looks at this stuff. And then you've got the position of the labyrinth. Why is it exactly there? Why is there a labyrinth in the Christian building? There are no labyrinths in the Bible. Well, because the people that were there before who were part of the Chartres uh, a School of Music, which still exists today, they were totally in understanding the relationship between energy, a portal, because it sits on a portal, and sound. And when you combine the two, uh, your consciousness goes way above the scale. It goes deep into the universe. So if you look at the eye of the labyrinth and relate it geometrically to the rest of the building, it gives you the blueprint to uncovering up two massive pentagrams that surround the existing building. So the geometry is hardwired into the shape of a cross. Very clever. Even the relationship between the pillars is related to a second geometry, and the crown of the building, which takes in the altar, is a third geometry. And it's the geometry which conceals the um, rays, the seven rays of the Egyptian goddess of sacred buildings, who, of course, is 
Sesha, who was the wife of the god of wisdom, uh, Jehuti, or as you came to know him, Toph. Mm. And that's just a little bit of that book. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it's a, it's an incredible building. Um, and there's another one like it just down the road that hardly anyone goes there. And they'll leave you alone there to actually do uh, spiritual things. Unlike in Chartres, they, they don't like woo-woo people in there. They uh, have a very bad attitude. So uh, they, they don't even like people walking the labyrinth on Friday morning when it's like 10,000 people go into the building. Uh, and they cover it with chairs. They'd wish the whole thing would just go away. So they're not pleasant people. But if you can just get around that small problem and go there and work quietly, uh, you'll get a lot out of it. But there is another church that was built by the Knights Hospitallers, who was um, the sister organization for the Knights Templar. They will allow you to do whatever you want in there. They're much more open because they come from that background. They come from that mistress teaching and they know exactly what's in that building so all of these places in Chartres uh all the buildings that are not facing east west which is the, tra the traditional trajectory for catholic buildings you know they're hiding something much older in, uh, underneath and of course Chartres is one of them mm -hmm. Freddie you also wrote a book about dogs what is the lesson <laughs> that you learned from your dog I don't have a dog. I wish I did. I travel so much uh, that I had the, uh, even my cat, uh, which I left with my former wife when I got divorced uh, in America, which broke my heart, really. Uh, divorce is kind of simple relative to leaving the cat behind because, you know, cats, they own you. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought, you know, I'd like to have a dog, but I, I, I can't bring myself to put him in a kennel or something. It's just not fair. Uh, so I'd rather go with that. Uh, but I, I was looking around, especially around COVID, and people were feeling pretty bad about life. And I figured, you know, we need a bit of levity. And I had all of these quotes in this box in my computer. And I thought, you know what? It'd be great to put together this little booklet, uh, a cheap little uh, book uh, of really positive quotes by different kinds of people from all kinds of things with little illustrations. And so you can carry this thing around with you. Just dive in one page uh, just read one of the uh, one page and you'll feel better. And I thought that's a good idea. So it's an inexpensive wager to help people get out of the doldrums whenever they feel it. Uh, but it is true. You know, things you learn from a dog is a very spiritual concept because if you observe dogs, they're very Zen. They'll teach you everything you know about life, including, you know, bark less and wag more. And you can't get more Zen than that, you know. Oh, beautiful. I have two dogs. In fact, one is with us right now, and she's always with me while I work. So she was listening very closely to your answer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they're totally psychic. They totally get it. It's just like cats. You watch cats in a room and they'll be sleeping and then suddenly they'll get up and they'll go. It's like they're tracking something in the room and you're going, what are you looking at? They know exactly what's going on. So it pays attention to to uh, observe animals. And one of my favorite things is to go to New Zealand in the winter or their summer. And uh, I've been trying to move there for years, and uh, it's become very difficult. So um, every time I go to New Zealand, I always go uh, hiking in mountains or lakes, and I'm usually there by myself. There's only four and a half million people in the in the island. So um I usually find myself sitting there wondering, and parrots will come and sit on me, uh, have birds that sit next to me. I have, uh, not in the mountains, but by the ocean, sea lions that pop over out of the water, look look at me, yawn, and they'll lie down next to me. I've had penguins pop out of the water and go, hey, what are you doing on my beach? And they'll waddle over. I love penguins. And they'll waddle over and they'll go, hi, what are you doing here on my beach? I said, well, I'm looking at where you just came from. Is it cold down there? Oh, Antarctica, terribly cold place. And you have this conversation in English with a penguin, and it's perfectly normal. And you can hear them. They're, they're not afraid of people. They haven't been hunted to extinction. So they come close up to you. And you've got to keep your space because you don't want to get too used because there'll always be some idiot that will cause them harm. But I just go on the landscape over there and find that there was one time on the planet where humans and animals got along just fine because we weren't hunting them, and they trusted you. And if there's one place on the planet that I found this still happens – it's actually in New Zealand, and I'm talking from experience. So to sit there, uh, one, you know, reading a book in the middle of a, you know, water coming down of a glacier in the middle of a mountain, a parrot lands on your shoulder, and he goes, "So, have you got a banana uh, in your <laughs> rucksack?" Said, As a matter of fact, I do have a banana. Uh, how do you people know this? I said, "All right, I suppose you're going to peel it for me." And you'll walk up my arm, you'll peel the banana, and you'll start eating it. And I said, "Well, I'm going to have oh, whatever. I, let me share the banana." They're very naughty, but they're not afraid. So it just shows you everything is quite possible.
Oh, your travels, um, unreal, the animals now. Yeah, that's huge to have those kind of experiences and connections with. I know. I just need to have a, another girlfriend in New Zealand so she can, uh, you know, uh, sponsor me to go and live there because that's the only way you can do it now, have a partner there, which I did actually, uh, and uh, or $15 million. I don't have $15 million. So uh, I'm, I'm going to have to be a bit more patient. Uh, I still feel hopeful that it might happen one of these days. Uh, I feel very – it's the first time in my life actually here on Earth that I've actually felt comfortable anywhere, uh, that particular part of the world. I do like it down there. I love the people, and I love the uh, indigenous people especially. They've got the best stories, especially the grandmothers. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, so beautiful. I have a very dear friend who lives there and comes back to the U.S. to do some work three times a year, and she has been bringing me wine from New Zealand, anything to convince oh. me. <laughs> to fly over and have the experience and understand the food is beyond. It's so organic and truly delicious from the earth. Yeah. I've never had a bad Sauvignon Blanc for New Zealand. I have a fridge full of them, actually. In fact, there's one really good one. Uh, can I promote this? Yeah. Yeah. Called Pomelo. You can't find it in New Zealand because they export every bottle. And I found it in my local supermarket in Maine. I thought, what are the chances of one of the best Sauvignon Blancs uh, which is like an estate brewed wine, but it's sold at a very reasonable price, uh, which you can drink every day. It's sold in my local supermarket. So when it shows up, I just get the entire shelf, put it in my basket and check out and say, that's breakfast. Uh, and they laugh at me and they said, mm. <laughs> And wait, tell me again the name of that, Sauvignon Blanc? Nobilo. Nobilo. Has a lovely fruity kind of nutty and woody texture. It does feel like it's uh, been stuck in an oak cask for about ten years. Unlike many, uh, you know, serving on blocks of that price, uh, it's very. Uh, it's usually like twelve dollars a bottle. Uh, you expect it to be like forty dollars or something at that point. But that was the point. It was uh, grown by I think it was a Latvian refugee who moved there. He said, "I want to do something that's really high end, but everybody can afford it." Mm -hmm. uh, talk about a nice guy. You know, he really had the right idea, and he said, "I'm not going to get rich soon. I'll get rich later." You know, which is a very good attitude, actually. You know, you make sure that everybody for, uh, affords it. And then the uh, the rewards are reaped much later. And that's a good um, a good zen uh, to follow. Beautiful. I'm definitely looking for that wine. So for folks who are listening to you, Freddie, and saying uh, sacred tours with this guy sounds amazing, books and other things that you offer, where should they go to connect with you? Oh, invisibletemple.com. And uh, for tours, you've got to get on the mailing list because the last two tours, I'm about to leave in three weeks for Portugal, back-to-back -back tours, and I'm not joking or exaggerating, they're sold out in 50 seconds. We ha we're, my uh, The person that runs my my, my glorious leader uh, in Canada, and uh, she looks after all the details, wonderful person. Uh, she works with Sacred, uh, she is Sacred Earth Journeys. And she said, you know, we have to do like a lottery because I'm getting a lot of hate mail from people that went fast enough on the buzz. And I said, yeah, I'm getting a lot of hate mail too. They're probably going to show up with flaming torches outside my front door soon uh, and or put voodoo on me. I said, yeah, we'll just get everybody to pile in their names in a big hat and we'll give them three weeks and then we'll take out the first 16 names out of a hat. I like to do small tours, make them personal. And, um, yeah, that's it. So 50 seconds. <laughs> That's like that a concert, amazing. like a rock star concert. I mean, what? who announced it? How did they sell out like that? Uh, I, people on my waiting list will know this, or I'll put it uh, on Facebook, uh, my page, uh, and then she will also release it to her people. So we've got about 30,000 people on the waiting list for anything. And Egypt's the same way. Uh, I had to move out to 26 people because... Getting me to Egypt is becoming very expensive because of the cost of oil at the moment, unfortunately. Uh, so we've had to take it up to 26, which is more than I want to do. But we also have to make a profit and keep it reasonable also for people. And we do spoil people. We, we put people up at the best places. We have an incredible itinerary. I don't know anybody that does, does what we do and charges less as we do. And we still make a profit. So I guess people are trying to make too much money. And that's not what I'm doing this for. Uh, again, like Nobilo, uh, man, I said, uh, my benefits will come eventually. Uh, even And having said that, I am driving a 20-year-old uh, car right now, so <laughs> uh, I need to get over that one. But we do make it worthwhile, and people do uh, uh, come on the tours because they expect 
not only to be given, you know, very interesting information, but I leave people alone to have an experience because otherwise you go home and it's just the voice of me in your ear and you won't remember anything and it'll be annoying. So we go out there, I point out what merits attention and I say, right, and for the next two hours, go and play. Find out uh, what brought you here and get something from the site. And it might happen now or in a week from now. But the point is to go back home different than when you arrived. And if they do, then I've done my job properly. And then, of course, we have four-hour dinners and we drink a lot and we have a great time. And then people keep coming back again and again and again. Uh, they can't get enough. So it becomes a bit of a family, you know, and some people have been on six, seven tours. So And they keep in touch with each other for a decade or so. So it becomes a bit of a camaraderie. And I, I kind of like that, you know. So I guess we're doing something right. Yeah, building community is very special. And your tours sound really magical. Uh, oh, proof in the pudding, fun. selling out in 50 seconds. Holy moly. Okay, so invisibletemple.com is where we find you. And Freddie, this is Dare to Dream. What are you next dare to dream? What are your future dreams and goals? <laughs> uh, finding out what the next project is going to be about, which is always a mystery to me. Uh, finding a place to live, which is in Portland, Maine, is the most difficult thing on the planet. Uh, even if you have, uh, if you even if you outbid ninety thousand dollars in cash, you'll still be outbid by someone from New York with even more cash. Uh, so I need to get that sorted out. I need to replace my twenty-year-old car, and I definitely need a, uh, I need a girlfriend, <laughs> and especially one that will get me to New Zealand or uh, wherever it is I need to go in my next lifetime. But yeah, I'm looking to settle my personal life a little bit better, uh, take uh, care of that, but also watching out for the next project, which is, I'm already hearing it. it. I get the sense that Northern France is calling and uh, I feel the pull to Northern France and all the megaliths that are up there. And yes, they're linked to Armenia as well. But apart from that, all I know is that they're related to fairies and that's all I know. Oh my God. Well, you are a really fat, I took so many notes. You're a really <laughs> fascinating guy. And I thank you so much for delivering such an incredible interview today. You, yes. I mean, next book, next project, please reach out to me. Um, maybe I can hook you up with New Zealand and my friend there, and she might know some people for you. You never um, know how these things happen. Exactly. <laughs> and then you'll have all the beautiful wine you want and a wonderful relationship in New Zealand with uh -oh. With I was just the there three months ago, and uh, I'm still getting over the hangover. It's met a lot of, <laughs> a lot of fascinating people, really lovely people. Well, it's been a pleasure. I've loved having you on. And I end today's show with this quote from Crazy Horse. Treat the earth well. It was not given to you by your parents. It was loaned to you by your children. We do not inherit the earth from our ancestors. We borrow it from our children. If you enjoyed this episode of Dare to Dream with Debbie Dashinger, if you learned something today, consider following the show, subscribe to this on your favorite platform, or most important, leave Dare to Dream a great review, five stars. It helps a lot. Truly, it does. Whether you're on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or any of the major podcast platforms, because this puts this information and the show in front of people who need to hear it, who are looking for this information. Thank you in advance. Next week on the show, I am speaking with Daniel Fusan. He is a channeler, a psychic reader, spiritual healer, and coach, and he is the founder of Wildflower Fire. Thanks for joining us today on Dare to Dream. There's so much in the world to go see, be, and do, and to get out of our own ways so that we can be in touch and receive the information there for us.